for, uh, this guest actually asked me to amp it up a little bit, so I'm gonna have to get high energy. I hope you all get high energy and enjoy this session. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce actor, author, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. You may know him best from his roles at CSI and The Good Doctor. Please welcome Hill Harper. Hey, 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 thanks. Uh, thanks. What's going on? That's good, good energy. What's going on, you guys? Hey, first of all, I wanna say shout out to the Mariners. Um, you know, I don't wanna take credit for this. I just wanna say, I, I know it's been 21 years in the making. Um, I'm, as a new Seattle resident, and the Mariners asked me to throw out a first pitch last season, and I moved from Brooklyn here, and I think I brought a lot of good baseball energy. So hopefully that went today, and I'm very excited, very excited. To, this is actually the first time I do, you know, talks like this all over, but the first time I've been able to do it here in my new, my new hometown. So, so this, is, this is great for me. And, and so first of all, I want you to turn, and you know, I'm trying to get a few things in Seattle. I'm trying to get used to the culture. I'm trying to learn how to keep my head down and not make eye contact. I'm trying to be socially awkward. It's, I'm, I'm figuring it out, but I'll get there, I'll get there. So, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the spirit of not being any of those things, turn to your neighbor on your right and say this. Say neighbor. No, come on, you guys. Neighbor, the future can be. And then neighbor, turn back to your left and say fair. Okay, beautiful. So what we're going to try to do is talk about the future being fair. How do we do that? Um, we're going to talk about this company I founded called The Black Wall Street. And the idea of The Black Wall Street is using a Web3 ecosystem and blockchain technology to, 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 to literally deal with the racial wealth and opportunity gap. And we want to build wealth, build self, and build community. And, and we can do that through a tech platform. And you ask, Hill, how can you do that? Well, first of all, I want to talk about the bad stuff first and, and sort of use this 1% as kind of a starting point for us to have this very quick discussion about something so big. And this 1% theme seems to run through a lot of things. Uh, an example, in 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, black people in America held a little less than 1% of American wealth. Today, 2022, you guessed it, black people in America hold a little less than 1% of American wealth. You say, oh, how could that be? 159 years. All these years later, um, 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 literally the same level of wealth holding or cross-generational wealth transfer as the end of slavery, that, 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 that would seem impossible. And then let's also think about uh, uh, the lending activity from our major banks across the country. Less than 1% of the lending activity or mortgage loans go to African Americans in this country. And then let's think about another 1%, unfortunately, venture capital money going to companies like mine. Less than 1% of VC money goes to uh, black founded or minority founded, even Latino founded uh, 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 startups. And so, unfortunately, we, if, if we're living in this 1% world, how can we actually build wealth, build self, build community in communities that have historically been locked out, particularly with a company like mine, which is a fintech? And, and we, if we want to think about financial services and, and traditional financial services, there's certainly been many impediments and blocks to folks actually being able to uh, uh, get access to capital flows. Uh, be able to open up new businesses, scale their businesses, and do all the things that we know create jobs and opportunity. So what I wanted to do was look, how, when have there been historical examples of historically marginalized communities actually building wealth, building jobs, building opportunity, and could we actually replicate that in code? Could we actually create a tech platform that replicates uh, 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 communities that have an ecosystem of prosperity through a fintech uh, 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 platform. And so what I did, and, and, and the reason why I wanted you to say the future can be fair, because as odd as this may seem, for historically marginalized communities, fairness is actually revolutionary. And, 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 and it, it, that may seem odd to you, particularly in this, in this environment where people use terms like woke or, 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 or as, as if equity or, or, or those types of words are, are bad words to say and you better shy away from. But I just want to talk about this idea of the future and fair. And so my favorite quote about the future is an old quote. And if somebody can actually tell me who said this, I will I'll give you a prize. Now, I, it's probably not as good as that Alaska Airlines prize that was just given out. 
but you know, it, 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 maybe it's something. I, I don't know what it's going to be. But, but here's my favorite quote about the future. The future does not belong to those who are fearful of bold projects and new ideas. But rather, the future belongs to those who can blend passion, reason, and courage into a personal commitment to the great ideals and enterprises of American society. Do any, does anybody know who said that? Offhand? Uh, just yell out a guess. Barack Obama. Did I say if you get it wrong, you owe me a prize? You owe me a prize. Okay. No, no. It's actually an old quote. It's a, it's a Bobby Kennedy quote. And Bobby Kennedy said, the future does not belong to those who are fearful of bold projects and new ideas. To me, that simply means the future does not belong to those who are uh, to, to people who are afraid of innovation, um, taking on big, big, big challenges and coming up with new ideas, new solutions. And that's where we are, and that's what we're trying to do with the Black Wall Street. And it, but, but it goes on to say, but rather, the future belongs to those who can blend passion, reason, and courage. And the reason why I talk about fairness is that uh, the first insight I had around this fairness issue was when I went to Brown University, um, I loved the fact that on the test and the exams, I could put my student ID. And because ultimately, it was just, fair, right? I, I, I wasn't being judged by any kind of inherent bias that was coming into the system that may, may be in the system and may have been there for years and years of legacy bias. And so, so I was judged that way. And it was great because ultimately I was valedictorian at Brown University because I feel like I was not prejudged. I feel like if my professors knew who I was, I may not have done as well. And so when I, I got a Sloan Fellowship to go to Harvard, and when I went to Harvard, I did a joint degree. I did a joint degree at the law school in the Kennedy School of Government, and the same thing was true there. I got to put my student ID on the exams and ultimately um, was able to excel uh, uh, at Harvard. And so I started thinking about this idea of fairness, and then we look back at communities across this country from the late 1800s through the early 1900s. Where were there? There were a vast majority of, of, of really tight African-American communities, uh, Bronzeville in Chicago, Paradise Valley and Black Bottom in Detroit, Harlem, Wilmington, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, Rosewood, the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. These were so-called Black Wall Streets where there was a level of prosperity so much so that other people, white folks, were coming there to get jobs. And, and so I wanted to figure out why. And I just I did, discovered, or at least I feel like, there were three key pillars to that, and then my challenge was, could we write those pillars in code and create a, a tech platform that, that represented these pillars? Pillar number one was trust. Folks trusted each other to work together, to loan each other money, to pay each other back, to buy goods and services from each other. Um, they trusted they'd, they'd, they'd get a, a quality product or, or get paid back. Uh, pillar number two, ownership. They own their businesses, they own their work product, they own their workflow. Pillar number three, uh, was the movement of money or capital within the ecosystem where a dollar would change hands 60 to 100 times. Back then, that was a year to three years. And so the challenge that I wanted to take on was, was that. So let's talk about trust first. Trust, uh, blockchain technology offers us the opportunity because obviously it's a trustless system. So, so we automatically, if we, if we build that ledger system right, if we build it correctly, we have trust inherently. You, pillar number two, ownership. Okay, how can we make sure that people own their own output? Um, I talk all the time that if you look at platforms like Clubhouse, black folks made and helped make Clubhouse a $4 billion app within two years. If you look at black Twitter and, and, and our activity on Twitter, if you look at TikTok and black music on TikTok, all of these platforms are extremely successful platforms, yet we own none of them, right? Yet our output is actually helping drive their profits. And so ownership is a key. Owning your output, owning who you are as a digital citizen, certainly in a Web3 environment, is going to be critical. And then let's get to the movement of money or capital within the ecosystem. That's critical. So right now we're, we're, in, and we're in a time where the Latino community has about $1.4 trillion of spending power. Black community has about $1.6 trillion of spending power. This is in the U.S. Uh, yet a dollar leaves our community within six to seven hours. To juxtapose that against different uh, cultural racial groups in, in this country, a dollar stays within the Asian American community about 21 days, uh, stays within the white community about 28 days, black community about six to seven hours. You say, Hill, how could that be? It could be that the fact is, if you are buying goods and services in your community and you don't actually own the businesses there, the money leaves immediately. Does that make sense? Particularly if you're having to do most of your financial services through, what do we have? Check cashing, payday lending, and those types of onerous or predatory financial services. So the question becomes, Hill, could you build a tech platform that disintermediates and actually 
uh, 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 provides the same level of services that you can get, whether it's from a check cashing or payday lender or from your traditional bank, and provide those services that allows and incentivizes a recirculation of the digital dollar within that. And that's what we try to do. So we try to build a digital wallet first, right? We start with a wallet. And then from that digital wallet, we start building on top of features and opportunities to grow. And we believe that if we actually can load in an entire ecosystem, encouraging folks to shop and pay on platforms, supporting businesses that are founded by women, women of color, supporting businesses that are founded by Latino founders, black founders, and other e-businesses, even in a marketplace format, we can then start to do that third pillar, which is the recirculation of the digital dollar. We can also do that, obviously, using cryptocurrency and other blockchain methodology through that. And so our goal is to then deal with that second half of that quote, because it said, the future does not belong to those who are fearful of bold projects and new ideas, but rather the future belongs to those who can blend. And there's three words, blend passion, reason, and courage. Passion to me simply means energy. Um, you know, any, is anybody here a physics major? Anybody here data physics major? I mean, did anybody? You, you, so, so th there you go. Okay, no. So physics tells us if you want to solve a big problem, if you want to take on a big problem and bring solutions to something big, um, energy is required, right? You, you have to have at least an equal or greater amount of energy to take on a big problem, right? And so we have to actually use passion and energy and ideas and money is energy, you guys. We actually need funding in this space to encourage and incentivize people to support the businesses, to create capital flows within, within the ecosystem. And so, and then the word, the second word is reason. That, make, that gives you the clue that it's an old quote. Um, it, it's, that's just about having a plan and a blueprint. And then the, the third word, my favorite word in the English language is the word courage. If you speak French, you know the etymology of the root of that word is core, which means heart. And obviously, this is a business that is a mission-driven impact business. And, and, and the reason why I bring this up, and I think it's critical to talk about, is that when I go sit in front of VCs and I talk about this business, this business only works as a long tail. In other words, I need impact or mission investment or patient capital to make it work. And most VCs don't want to offer that, right? They don't want patient capital. In fact, I had a VC sit back and say, um, you know, I've, I've kept all my rates lower than Coinbase, Cash App, any, anybody. To, we're at 1.75% for any activity on the platform. And, and I did that specifically. And I had a VC sit across from me and say, Hill, you got to raise it to 8%. And I said, well, you know what, I'm, I'm actually trying to put payday lenders and check cashing spots out of business, not become a digital payday lender. And he said, well, you're thinking about it the wrong way. you got to think about that other 6.25% as the education expense, as the idea that you're bringing new people to the space and it's going to cost you more to educate. And I said, well, if that makes you sleep better at night, that's great. But the point is what we're trying to do is bring new people into the space. Uh, we have 90% of our folks on our platform have never had a digital wallet before. And so I'm very proud of that idea because if we can get marginalized communities and so-called marginalized communities and people from those communities actually operating and seeing themselves as digital citizens and seeing their value as digital citizens, we can begin to offer them services that are very low cost. So for instance, we can get people out of cash and this ultimately is the key piece here. 80 to 90% of the assets held by folks in marginalized communities they hold their assets in cash. And why is that so destructive? And there's no way you can build wealth that way because why? Inflation punches you in the face. So every time somebody from the community goes to bed at night, they wake up poor the next morning. And so in that in, in that world, if you can't get folks into ascending value asset classes, there is no way you can build any kind of cross-generational wealth. So what we want to provide and create is a, is, is a very low-cost way that folks can get out of cash in their wallet, be in ascending value asset classes, and then get back into cash if there is a liquidity event need. And then you can see where this is going. We actually can provide much lower lending rates if you have some collateral in the wallet. We don't have to care about a, a, a potentially a problematic or bias credit score that's inherently biased because you're holding assets in the wallet. And we can start to solve for the liquidity problem by doing things, uh, uh, by bringing people into a system that hopefully they trust. And, and, and that's what I'm so proud of. And so the team that we've built and what we're doing, and, the, and I think you guys in Seattle should be proud because I've built the company here and, and have, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing jobs here. We're hiring black and brown engineers. 
and, and we're doing it the right way. We're trying to build the company the way that we're out there talking about the way companies should be built. And, 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 and I'm very proud of that. And so um, I, I'm going to leave about two to three minutes for any questions uh, because I think that uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys have questions about this because it's something to me that's so important. Right over here. There's a mic, There's a mic coming. Uh, sort of two point. Um, one, I came from the inner city myself, and I was fortunate to get out through foster care, right? So I always wonder what would my future have looked like? And so much to me is education, right? Like I didn't know to even look for something like this, right? So how, how do we get this into the inner cities? So that's like part one. And then um, part two is just like, what could we do as individuals and companies to be allies? Like I I'm over here going, yes, 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 to everything you're saying, like, how can I help? Well, th thanks so much. So the f first question is, I'll give you an example. We have this thing called the Digital Financial Revolution Tour. We've done 33 cities the past two years, and we, ch we take on the, um, the, 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 the lowest income congressional districts in the country. And so a great story is we drove into Mound Bayou, Mississippi, um, uh, one day, and this older, older black man, he's probably 75 or 80 years old, he comes up. And we say, hello, sir, how are you? He said, what are you doing? We have our bus, Digital Financial Revolution. We're talking about financial literacy because it has to start with education first, to your point, right? So our platform really fundamentally is a financial literacy platform that is going to offer all these other features that you can do once you've decided and hopefully learned that you want to do dollar cost averaging. Maybe you can do $6 a day. Maybe you can do $6 a week. Maybe you can only do $6 a month. But once you make that decision, we want to offer you opportunity of where you want to put that $6. But so we're in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. He walks up and he says, sir, you want a T-shirt? And you want to, we're about to do our talk. And he says, I just have one question. I said, I thought it was going to be like a financial question. I said, yes, sir. He said, why are you here? He's like, nobody comes here. Nobody comes to Mound Bayou, Mississippi, literally. And you start to realize that the work is just in showing up, really just showing up. And we can show up online. We can show up. Uh, in person, and we have to do it in all verticals, no question. We have a whole program for returning citizens and folks coming back out of being incarcerated and out of the system, back in. We, we want to have programs for everybody. It's not about where you've been. It's about where you can go, and that's what we're going to do. And as far as allies go, I mean, obviously, the easiest ally, you guys take out your phone, download the Black Wall Street, go to your app store or Google Play, because obviously the more downloads we have, the more attractive we are to potential uh, VCs, investors, et cetera. And if there's anybody... Anybody who wants to, to help us in whatever way, just DM me on Twitter or, 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 or Instagram or whatever. Just, just hit me. It's Hill Harper. Because this, this movement is about people joining hands. My favorite quote from Dr. King is when he said, we're all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny. I can't do this, and, and black folks can't do it on their own, and Latino folks can't do it, and white folks. We actually got to solve these big, big, big problems together. We have to kind of link arms and say, hey, I think I can help in this regard. I think I can help in this regard. I mean, our biggest challenge right now is funding because we need funding to add features. You know, and it could be in kind. Look, I could take a, you know, some great engineers. We need to add more features because right now we, we're so limited with our features that we need people. Some people don't want to buy this or buy that or dollar cost average into this. We want to add as many opportunities as possible and have banking partners and all the different things. You know, I just had a a really interesting conversation with Plaid, as an example. I'm getting punched in the face by my Plaid fees, right? And because they're not really equipped to handle like a growing small company with, with the, t the type, of, but I got to connect my wallet to a bank account. And I want to use Plaid, but it's like, it's hard to grow and scale. So I had to actually stop promoting the app for a while because my KYC costs were so much. And I knew that I didn't have enough features on there to justify that expense. What I mean by if I'm only taking 1.75% and the average transaction on my, my app right now is $45, you can see that that doesn't add up to much, particularly if it costs me $4.50 to link your bank account and KYC you. That's a recipe for failure. And so there's a lot of these back office things that keep companies like this from actually working and scaling that we need to actually solve. And it's a longer tail, because obviously once we have scale and mass, you know, it'll kick in. That 1.75% will add up over time if we have enough transactions happening. But in the early days, when you don't have enough, it, it doesn't work. Um, I think we are uh, basically out of time. Um, I just want to say, oh, you're going to come on up. No, 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 no. no. Uh, 
Hill. Yes. Passion, yes. reason, and, and courage. courage. And, and, and just to so make sure you're listening, what is the etymology or the root of the word courage? <laughs> Co heart, core, your heart is right here. So this, this is ultimately, I think when we're in tech and you're talking to, we're always talking tech and code and platforms, we, we lose the heart sometimes. And why do we want to solve these big problems? You know, we want to solve them because we can make the world a better place. And to me, that's where the heart piece comes in. And that's why we have GeekWire Summits. And that's why we want to network and meet different people. Because if we bring our heart first, everything else can come. And that's, that's what I love. So thanks so much. Phil Harper. Be sure to check out The Black Wall Street, theblackwallstreet.com. Also, Letters to a Young Brother and The Conversation. Any other books you want to plug, Hill? The Good Doctor. And The Good Doctor. 10 p.m. Monday nights on ABC.